We've been talking a lot on my channel about the online cult Twin Flames Universe and a big argument against this group being a cult has been, well, it's an online cult. You can't be in a cult if it's online. And I just want to make a video about the fact that it is very, very much possible to get involved in an online cult. And I know this because I actually was in one. And I've been asking people to come forward with their stories. And if I'm going to ask you to come forward and share your story about your involvement in Twin Flames Universe or any other problematic group or cult, it's not really fair if I don't share my own story. So today I thought I would do just that, give you a little unscripted and honest storytelling about how I got involved in an online cult and how I got out. It's time to open our minds and let the fresh air in. Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel or welcome if you're brand new. I'm so happy you are here. My name is Erin and I am fascinated by all things cult, true crime, or unique spiritual practices. On Tuesdays, I like to explore a true crime case that I find kind of strange or interesting or concerning. And on the weekends, Saturday or Sunday, I like to post a video about a cult or an extreme religion that is interesting to me or I want to expose and bring awareness to. Today is Thursday Thanksgiving and throughout November and December, I'm bringing to you a third bonus video on Thursdays. I was going to do this weird cannibal Thanksgiving true crime story today, but for whatever reason, I felt more pulled to tell my own story. But if you like true crime and cults and anything in between, please consider subscribing. I would absolutely love to have you here. I also like to recommend a book at the beginning of my videos. And since in a couple of my other videos, I said I'm a spiritual babe, I thought I would once again recommend The Witch of Portobello by, and I always pronounce his name incorrectly, Paolo Colo. Um, he's the same writer of The Alchemist, and I know everyone thinks that, like, The Alchemist is, like, this incredible spiritual book, which it can be, but that was not his intention when he wrote that book, oddly enough. It just kind of blew up as this spiritual text. And honestly, this book, maybe it's because it's centered around a woman and it's more of a woman's story, whereas The Alchemist is centered around a boy. Um, this resonated a lot more with me, and I highly recommend you reading it. It's very interesting. It's a really great, um, not fiction, not false, so fiction book. <laughs> so um, I hope you enjoy this book. Let me know if you've read it or if you have any other suggestions down below. So let's get right into it, guys. I am back with another unscripted kind of off-the-cuff video, and I like that kind of video, but I do know that I can be long-winded when I <laughs> don't have a script in front of me, so I apologize if this video is a little bit long. Um, I'm posting it on Thanksgiving 2023, so I hope wherever you are, you are feeling love, you're feeling full, and you're feeling grateful. Um, and I'm just really glad that you're spending time with me watching this video on this special day. So like I said in my intro, we've been really discussing the Twin Flames universe cult. We've been trying to ex expose the tactics. I've been connecting with you all a lot more on one-on-one, -on -one, even in my emails, which is erinfinley at gmail.com if you feel so inclined to email me and share your story. Um... And I'm really excited for some future potential interviews or collaborations that I'm working on right now. But again, I just felt like it wouldn't be fair if I didn't share my own story. Um, and I'm realizing sitting down to record this that it's really vulnerable and kind of scary to actually vocalize and admit that you got involved in a cult or extreme group without knowing what it was. And it only makes me realize that the people that have been whistleblowers, like all of the people who participated in the documentaries for Twin Flames Universe, everyone who participated in The Vow, 
Leah Remini and her whistleblowing with her A&E show. It's just like incredible that you all are speaking out and you have a lot more closer connection than I ever did to the people, the leaders, I guess, within the group I was involved in. So I truly commend you because I'm learning that this is not very easy. It's actually very, very vulnerable. Um, so I just ask for like grace and understanding. Um, this video is going to be my story of how I got involved in this group. And I will do a follow-up video later um, that does a deep dive into this group because when I first learned I was in a cult, I had to go do a deep dive of it. Um, so that's going to be its own video because there's a lot of information. Like I found out about me, my involvement, I think a year and a half ago. So at that time, I like dove in to learn everything I could about this group and it's still existing today. So I definitely want to take some steps to hopefully bring awareness to it since it does operate on the internet and it is an international group. So let's just start from the beginning. I'm sure all of you had a very strange and transitionary 2020 like I did. Um, two weeks before the world had shut down, I had just moved into a new apartment by myself and I'd been in a long-term relationship with my current fiance for um, like four years at the time. So I was living by myself in a city and in a new space. And then the world shut down and we made the decision that I would go live with him so that I wasn't alone because we didn't know how long everything was going to be shut down. And it was particularly difficult for me because I haven't really spoke much about this on this channel, but I'm an actor. And my whole life really revolved around acting and the pursuant, the pursuant, the pursuing of acting. And it was the first time in my life where I felt like I had a full on identity crisis. I was like, what do I do with my time? What do I do with my life? What do I do with my brain? How do I connect to me? Who am I if I'm not performing? Who am I if I'm not an actor? And um, it was a really strange mindset to be in. And I got like very, very depressed. And um, so when I moved in with my fian now fiance at the time, I thought it was going to be such a great idea. And it was long term for him and I, but he lived with two other men and this huge dog. I have a very old cat. She's always at the end of my little videos, um, walking around this green couch. And I just thought it was going to be amazing. And I got there and I had no space to myself. The dog and the cat could not be in the same room together. Um, so it was a very difficult situation for me to be in. I'm used to having my own space. I'm used to kind of working on my own time. Um, I'm used to working a lot. I'm kind of a workaholic. So it was definitely like a shock to my system to just be surrounded by dudes. We all had a single bathroom we were sharing. One dude had a bathroom in his room, but like you never went, we never went in there. So it was like two dudes and me sharing a bathroom. I have a cat that can't, cat can't leave our little tiny bedroom. So it was very confined and I found myself feeling really rigid. I was definitely not the best version of myself during that time. But during that time, I was also involved in, um, online acting classes. A lot of studios started doing like online scene study, online audition classes. So I was trying to participate in those to like hopefully keep my brain going and keep myself inspired and motivated. And um, one of my – and I had gotten into breath work too. My fiance was really into Wim Hof and breath work. And uh, I was like, okay, I'm going to start getting involved in this too. And I'd spend doing my breath work every day and my meditation every day. And I do love breath work. Not as much as I used to, I think, because of this group. But um, – and I still meditate every day. So I was like, yeah, I want to like figure out how I can go even deeper. And I think sometimes in these spiritual practices, your ego gets involved because you recognize that like it's something that not everybody does and you realize that it's something that's very difficult to like be disciplined enough to do. And there is a part of you that's like, oh, I'm so much better than people that don't do any breath work. And it's not a good mindset to be in because A, you're kind of isolating yourself from people and being kind of a dick. But B, you're also wanting the next thing. And it's not necessarily because you want to 
be able to hold your breath underwater or like you're going to go scuba diving next year and you want to learn how to like free swim or whatever. It's just like your ego wants to be better than the other people around you. Oh, you did breath work for 20 minutes this morning? Well, I did it for a half hour. Oh, you did it for a half hour? Well, I did it for 60 minutes straight. And it's almost this like spiritual egotistical practice that isolates you from other people and Um, you know, obviously not everybody does it. So you're just like competing with the few friends you have. It's very like a very strange mental game you're playing with yourself. And I think coupled with the isolation of 2020, it just felt like this is my thing that I get to do. And it means that I'm doing something good with my time, even though looking back, I totally would have used my time differently. So I'm in an acting class, an online acting class one day, and the teacher signs off and says that they're going to this like intense three hour breathwork workshop and meditation. And I was like, sounds like that would be right up my alley. I want to do it. Give me the info. I'm coming. I'm going to go do it. And so I don't know if it was that weekend, but uh, the next weekend, it was always on a Friday night. We would log on to our Zoom meetings. We would connect our headphones. We would write out our intention and it would start out three hours. Like you write out your intention, you share with the group because it's like a group meditative class. You share with the group what your intention, what you're wanting to get out of that session. You journal a little bit and then you lay down and you start this very, very, very intense breath work. Like Wim Hof, it's very like intense in and out, but there are breath holds. With this, it was probably 90 minutes of just, and I don't want to blast your ears out, but it was 90 minutes of while we were laying down and while the leader was just watching us online for an hour and a half. And then the next probably like 45 minutes to an hour, because remember, this is like a whole three hour long session on a Friday. Okay. We would come out and, or no, we would be med. He would, uh, after our breath work, we would be guided into this meditation. And it does your body for me, it felt like when you know you have your foot's asleep, but it's like, it feels good. It's a good asleep. It felt so good all over my body. It was that like gentle tingling. I just felt like my body was awake and alive. It just, it felt like literally all my cells were moving and on fire and electric. And I thought it was just like this incredible feeling. And then you meditate after and you're the Zen, the floating sensation is like unmatched. Like I've never been, if you meditate, you might understand the feeling and sensation that I'm like describing. It really, really felt like I was floating in space and like connected to something bigger than myself. And I've never ever, I haven't gotten that deep since. And before I hadn't ever gotten that deep in my meditation. So to me, it felt like I was doing something like incredible. And then afterwards we would come to and kind of share about our experience for the last half hour, 45 minutes, and then be on our way. And then we were on the email list and got all of the other offerings. And I remember at the time thinking, this is really cool. Like this guy just like by word of mouth, he has no marketing that I can find online. He's just conducting this breathwork workshop and he's doing it without any marketing. He, we, it was like 50 bucks a session or something. So it's like, you know, on his Friday night, like what a great way during a global shutdown to make some extra money online. You're just like, Hey, 10 people come spend 50 bucks you know, he's making 500 bucks a pop on a Friday night. So I was like, this is a really good business plan. I would love to do something like this. And I got my fiance involved too. And I remember me and my fiance did it. We did it in separate rooms so we could fully have our like experience. And I want to mention too that this guy controlled all the music. It wasn't like I got to pick what music I wanted to listen to. He curated a playlist for us. I don't know. He might have made his own tracks too throughout the duration of our meditation. And so I invite my fiance to do it and he loved it too. But we both kind of giggled because like we started noticing some like extremely sexual things that the guide would say while we were doing our meditation. Like (laughs) we would be laying there in our meditation and you would suddenly just hear the leader go, go deeper come deeper, keep coming. (laughs) It's just like, keep coming, keep coming. 
so it, we would laugh about it later, but like we started noticing more and more how like inherently sexual it was becoming. And um, over time, the leader got more like well dressed. It used to feel very casual, but then it got a little more like, well, he like would wear like a little like collared shirt with a vest and stuff, which is great. Like look professional. That's awesome. But I did notice that he always had a picture of someone behind him. And I remember one day I just noticed it because one day it wasn't there and then the next day it just was. And I was like, huh, that's weird. I wonder. It, and it was one of those pictures that looks like it's like not a real photograph. It's like a drawing of someone with like a hue. And it looked like, you know, I think it's in like North Korea where he like forces you to have a picture of like the dictator in the kitchen or whatever. Or when people have, like, pictures of Donald Trump in their, like, foyer and it's, like, praise this guy. It's just, like, weird. That's kind of what it felt like to me. But I just kind of, like, shrugged it off because I was like, oh, I'm online. Like, he's not going to get to me. I'm just here for the breath work. Well, I had been still spiraling into kind of, like, this depression, confusion, not sure what I was doing. I really didn't like my living situation. I didn't have any money coming in to get out of my living situation. Um, so I was starting to feel very trapped and I was like, I need to work. I know I need to work on myself. I know I need to work on my mindset and everyone online, everyone's always like, work on your mindset. I was like, okay, I know I need to work on this. And so happens this leader is starting this new class and there's going to be an additional leader and it's going to be on Saturdays and it'll be a meeting for an hour and a half. And it basically felt like a condensed version of the meditation and then longer sharing. So this group of us came together, and I think I was doing this for about a year. Every Saturday, the middle of the day, I would log on, I would do my meditation, and I would share all of my week's lessons and experiences with this group of random people who were joining in from all over the world. And... There was this woman there that was like kind of guiding the person who had been leading the meditation. So it was like he was the co-lead and she was like the lead, right? And they had started referencing something called the center. And I was like, the center, this must just be where they go meditate. Because I know they did have an in-person location and they called it the center. And I was just like, oh, it just felt like YMCA vibes, like the YMCA of meditating. And I knew that several people within my group, they would go to this weeknight meditation class and the Friday night class and the Saturday class. And each thing cost money. Each thing cost money, right? The meditations were each 50 bucks. And the I forget how much the Saturday one was, but I think it was like $200 for like eight weeks or something like that. Maybe a little bit more. I, can't, I honestly, I could look back at my emails. And so it was a lot, a lot of like sharing and then showing growth. And as time went on, as we continued sharing these things with each other, it started becoming, and I felt this too, like if people in our lives aren't doing this type of work, it's just getting really difficult to like be around them. I remember saying that. I remember saying that. I mean, part of spirituality is kind of like letting go of that voice, that ego in your head. But we were all totally just like, yep, yep, yep. We are better than everybody. And if you don't do this weird online meditation class with us and work on yourself in this exact way, then you're not as good as us and get out. And <laughs> it was very much like a uh, a safe space to share. We all would cry. We would all have these moments of extreme emotion in this class or in this, you know, session online. And you do just start feeling incredibly connected to these people. I trusted both the leaders that they were going to help me be guided. I could call up them, call them up if I had an issue. I was rooting for the people in my group. I was loving them. Like, and that's, I think, exactly what people like Jeff and Shalia are doing. They're creating this online group and you just feel this intrinsic bond with the people in the group because you are sharing so much with them. You're so vulnerable. And I think in this world, like, it's, I'm an actor and actors in class get very vulnerable. I've even argued that certain acting schools are kind of culty. But you do, you're just, 
you're constantly sharing and oversharing parts of you with people that are not licensed therapists or psychologists. And it's a group setting. So you're learning these very intimate details about each other. And it's understood specifically that you should not and you will not share the information with anybody else. But people, there were a couple times where I was like, oh, you shouldn't judge this person. But they did something that was so against my morals and even against the law that I felt like, well, they're here because they're grown. Like you justify it in your brain. They're here because they're trying to change. They're here because they're trying to grow. Yes, that's a terrible, terrible, terrible thing they did. I would never even share it in this space if I'd ever done something like that. But at least they're trying to grow. Like you're able to like that. And I think that's where you start almost like self indoctrination because you're finding reasons to justify behavior that should be raising these huge, massive alarms, right? These huge red flags should be waving. And you're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to put those down because like this person's trying. This person's trying. And I think that's a super dangerous place to be. I think that's what has happened within groups like Twin Flames Universe is people have shared in group settings with these coaches, with Jeff and Shalia themselves. The group I was in, they recorded every single session and then they would send it to the group. So if I ever needed or wanted to reference other people's trauma or I ever needed or wanted to hold something against somebody, I had audio and visual proof of them saying it. And so does the leader, right? And it's just it's it's really scary that that stuff is out there and I think that with Twin Flames Universe, it's or any online group, it's so easy to think like, well, it's online. There like there's no way it's a cult. But I cannot stress this enough. A cult is not location based. It's all about what's going on in here. It's all about what's going on in your brain and how you're changing the way you see things. Change like I just said, there were people doing monstrous, illegal, terrible things that I would want to report. But I was in this mindset of, well, they're here and they're trying to work on themselves, so I know they're a good person. I don't really want to engage with them anymore, but I'm going to respect that they're here. I'm going to respect that they're trying to change. And then you start seeing the good things in them, right? You're like, well, okay, well, now they're a great partner and they're a great father. And it's okay that they did these really bad things because they're different now. They've grown. They've changed. And I'm sure in a group like Twin Flames Universe, it's not just do you find will you find your twin flame? They've implemented other ways to change your mindset and implement their own thinking, like the map, the mind alignment uh, program, I think is what it is, where they needed to expand their reach to people who didn't just want to find a, a twin flame. They wanted to expand their reach to people who have PTSD, who are just challenged in life, who need a mindset coach, who need mindset changing or training. And so they're literally creating a different roadmap in your brain. That's why they're calling it MAP. It's a different roadmap where if normally you always take a right-hand turn. They're saying, no, it's okay to take a left. But that left-hand turn re- leads to the same place every time. It leads to indoctrination. It leads to pain. It leads to suffering. And this is pain and suffering that you might not even recognize that you're experiencing because the cult mindset reprogramming of your brain isn't making those alarm bells ring anymore because anytime you feel and I've felt it you feel that gut feeling of like this is not good you are able to justify it so slowly that voice like stops popping up and all of a sudden you're like and we see it in the group with some of the people responding with the flowery flowery ugh, flowery language and ex- saying just a whole lot of nothing It's because they're not able to see the alarm bells. They're not able to think critically. They're not even able to consider the other side of of the coin. And so that's how easy it can happen, even in an online space, especially if you are consistently meeting up with these people. I mean, I was meeting up with them twice a week. Some people in the group were even doing three or four times a week. And it's sad because a few months ago, I went back to check in on some of the people that I had been in the group with to see how they were. And they had posted these testimonials on the group's page. And it really broke my heart because everyone was in tears because everyone's still going through healing. And that's fine. I mean, releasing 
tears as a great way to heal and get rid of emotion and ener- negative energy that's like stuck in your body. But it felt to me like there was so much pain. It didn't look like tears of joy. It l- felt like the pain was still there. And it's like almost like the group wanted you to keep feeling pain. And the second that you started feeling better, they would use the things that they've learned about you, that they've shared about you to bring you back down. And that brings me to how I actually got out of the group. We had been working on our triggers. And so one week we had shared what our biggest triggers were. And then um, the following week, we came together to share how we had gotten triggered and how we had used the steps that they had laid out in front of us to help us calm our trigger down. And I seemed to always end up speaking last in this group. They would like pick. And I know I can be long-winded, so maybe that's why. (laughs) But I remember we were getting down to the end and everyone had shared. Everyone had shared for probably like 15, 20 minutes each. And it was finally my time to share, but we didn't have much time left in class. I think we had like 10 minutes left in class. And I'm thinking, okay, well, we'll probably just go a little long. We've gone long before. Like, you know, everyone's only here for this today, right? And we're always crying after this. So we all were like, yeah, I don't plan anything after this class. (laughs) It's our life was becoming more and more devoted to this work, this work. And so it's finally my time to talk. And I had had this really crazy experience with a best friend of mine. And she triggered me so much. And it was one of the first times in my life that I felt like I not only stood up for myself, but I left the situation being okay if we never would ever be friends again. And I'm usually the one that's like, we have to mend this, we have to mend this, we have to mend this. And it was the first time in my life where I was like, you know what? Maybe we shouldn't mend this. Maybe it's not. Maybe we just don't work together anymore. Maybe we're no longer friends. And that's okay. And I felt so proud of myself for like groundedly being able to recognize that. And one of my triggers I had expressed was I hate feeling like I'm being ignored or like intentionally misunderstood um, or not listened. And that stuff makes me really angry (laughs) and frustrated and sad, all the things. And I remember I was telling my story and the leader looks at me and she was like, can you wrap this up? And immediately I was like, oh my God, you just triggered me. And I literally just finished telling you that this is a major, major trigger for me. And I have a hard time controlling my facial expressions. (laughs) So my face must have just been like, because... Uh, I just kind of shut down. I didn't share anymore. I was just like, wow, okay. And it was after that session, I got, I shut my computer and it was the last session of that like two month series. And they were selling this like super intense class next. It was going to be even deeper than what we were already doing. The deepest work yet, blah, blah, blah. And so, and it was a bigger price tag. And then they were having in-person retreats. Like it was just kind of escalating as time went on. And that was the first time where I was like, what the f- is going on in this group? Like, you're supposed this is supposed to be a safe space. I'm supposed to share as well, just like everybody else. And you're triggering me and you're bringing me down. Like, now I feel shut down. I feel all the things I've said that make me feel small, you're doing to make me feel small. But if I don't feel small and I start sticking up for myself, which is what I was proud to share I had done, the group can't control me anymore, right? So I think that was her trying to chink away at my armor, like chink away at me to bring me back down because I actually was growing, (laughs) you know. And I remember I just did not sign up for the next session. And the next session is coming up. It's like in the next couple of days. And the breathwork guy calls me up and he said, hey, um, I wanted to talk. I could tell that you were kind of upset about what happened in class. And I was like, oh, man, here we go. And I just said, you're like, you know, I think I just like want a break from the group for a little bit. I think I need to kind of process things myself. I just started working with like an actual therapist and the financial um, requirements of that and this group were just kind of feeling like a lot to me. So I knew I had to let go of something and I didn't want to let go of my therapist because it was like he's a licensed professional, you know. Uh, <laughs> so um, I expressed that to him and he said, you know, there are going to be moments that you feel that resistance. Whenever I feel that resistance with my master, I know it's time to dive in deeper and recommit. 
And I remember feeling like, master? Master? I would never call anyone my master. Are you jo- Are you kidding me? Is this a joke? And that was the like biggest flag that started waving. And I finally kind of saw things. And I had kept hearing about them referencing the center, the center, the center. And I was kind of, I was like, okay, Aaron, change your tune. Act like you're more receptive than you are. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Maybe I do need to dive in a little bit deeper. He was at the point where he was like offering scholarships, like we can lower the price for you. Because I also referred people. So they knew I had a network of people that I could like bring in, which I'm glad I didn't. And I immediately called them up after this conversation was like, hey, we're in a cult. We should quit. Um, (laughs) But um, I remember... I was like, act cool, Aaron. And I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. I'll consider it. I'm going to sleep on it and see how I feel tomorrow. Thank you so much for calling. What's the center again? Like, because I'm going to be in the area and I'd love to like come check it out. I lied. And he said, oh, it's called the center of the golden one. Doesn't sound culty at all, right? So obviously being the person that I am, who's fascinated by cults, by the way, I've been watching The Vow while I've been getting involved in this online cult. So when I say it can get anyone, even those people that are trying to become educated or who are incredibly smart, if we're vulnerable enough, they will find us. They will they will get us to get sucked into it. And that's exactly what happened to me. So of course, I go down this rabbit hole and I've rewatched The Vow like twice. I've watched Seduced. I've watched every Nexium documentary I can find every Scientology documentary I can find, every, I've like researched cults. Like I'm, I've am i gotten obsessed with cults at this point. And I think it was like something's looking out for me and saving me <laughs> because all of a sudden everything started clicking. The tactics, I was vulnerable. I shared a lot of collateral. Um, I was starting to feel like this was my community, my home, the only people that understood me. I was isolating myself from other people, not because I thought they were bad, but because I felt like, oh, these are my people. We're on the same path. I don't need anybody else. I just need my online group of friends trying to heal, right? I mean, people were leaving their jobs because this group made them feel like they didn't need a safety net. If it's not right for you, just jump off the cliff and hope that something catches you. Like terrible choices, then people would be like unemployed for weeks. Like we were in the con- the coerced control of these leaders. So when I heard center of the golden one, immediately down the rabbit hole. And this is going to be a video for a completely different day. Um, I'm going to do a deep dive on the center of the golden one. And I looked it up on... Um, I'll never forget this. And I actually was just reminded of this before I started shooting this video. I looked them up on Google and I found them and I started going through the reviews. It was like five stars. This is great. This is great. This is great. And then someone wrote, if you can't see that this is a cult, you are too far gone. You are way better off Googling miracle of love than you are going to this place or Google miracle of love before you go into this place before you step foot in there. And so I started Googling Miracle of Love. And turns out it was a very intense, scary cult back in like the uh, two, early 2000s. So it was run by this like random white dude. And one day he claimed to have, like they always do, claimed to have heard a voice or seen a vision that he was actually divine and sent from God and his true name was Garasana. Like, yeah, this white dude's true name is Garasana. Okay. And then his wife, um, she changed her name as well. And then he passed away and she kept the cult going. And I was like researching and redditing and people reached out to me and said like, yep, my mom was in this group. It was incredibly dangerous. That woman ruined our lives. And then this woman passed away in like in 2010, I think. And I guess there were people in the group who wanted to continue. And suddenly this leader named The Lady came to be. And I started listening to some of her recordings on their website and watching videos of people on their Facebook group. And it was the same vibe and energy of this almost like sad, melancholy this is so healing. This is so great. And I'm like, really? Is it? Because you all look so freaking miserable. Like what? You're happy? Really? You're happy? You're crying nonstop. And 
I watched one video of someone, and I'll share this these videos in my deep dive, but he was literally saying that he, like, would devote his life to this group because of what he felt like it did for him. And it's sad. It's kind of like when people are so far gone and they're – it's like that glossed out – they just kind of talk monotone, but they think it's because they're enlightened and it's very calm and monotonous and chill, but there's like this deadness in their eyes. And it's that way of like talking that like almost every person had. And it was so disturbing. And hearing stories from people that were in the group back in 2010 was upsetting. And I remember reading or maybe the woman on Reddit told me, I'm going to have to go back through all of my messages and stuff um, for this deep dive. But apparently people still within the cult wanted to regroup, right? Because they didn't like that there was such a negative connotation attached to their group. So they, but they liked some of the teachings, which was like this Garasana style of meditation, which is the meditation that I had been practicing for like a year and a half at that point. This woman, the lady, started back, started the group back up again as a meditation center because they wanted to clear themselves away from this like cult mentality, this cult mi mindset. They wanted to kind of rebrand, I guess. So they opened up the center of the golden one. Well, guess what the golden one means? Garasana. That's what Garasana means. So they're saying they're no longer a cult, but they're opening up the center of the cult leader. Like, it doesn't like really it doesn't make sense so i was listening to these recordings and there were there was like one picture of the woman who goes by the lady and several audio recordings from like the early 2010s and maybe late 2000s too and i'm listening and then i'm going onto my email where i have those group meetings and i'm listening to the woman that was in charge of my group meetings and they sound exactly the same. It sounds like an older version of these audio recordings from like 10 to 15 years ago. And all of a sudden I was like, I am in an online cult. And it just clicked. Everything started happening for me. From the manipulation tactics to the guilting to stay in to the pushing you down so that you need the leaders even more to wanting this approval by the group. Um... I started kind of thinking back and I started rec recognizing that all the people in the group were all being preyed upon because they were all in AA. What kind of a person preys upon people that are already trying to heal themselves and get them more involved into a cult, which I think one could argue is potentially an addiction? If you get addicted to the group, addicted to the practices, addicted to the teachings, I was getting addicted to just feeling like I was better than everybody because I was doing intense breath work and meditation. That's still a type of addiction, I feel like. So there were so many red flags that started popping up and I called my friends that I'd gotten involved and I was just like, this is going to sound crazy and far-fetched, but like, I don't think this is a good group to be in. And luckily, one of them was like, I've been feeling weird for a few weeks like I gotta get out of here and the other one was just kind of like just more devastated because it's hard to hear like I, I shared all of my findings and it's really heartbreaking because you do want to feel like you are smarter than this and I'm someone and I think this is why I'm fascinated by cults in general I've always seen the good in people like I never used to think that people weren't you know, giving their best selves or didn't have my best interest in mind because I try to be kind like that to others. And so me learning the manipulative tactics that other groups and their leaders are using helps me understand because those manipulative tactics are the same tactics used by abusive partners, narcissists, <laughs> salesmen sometimes. So it's able to help me in my growth to really start like standing up for myself and set boundaries. Like, no, I'm not going to devote every day of my weekend to sitting alone in my bedroom, meditating with people on the internet and sharing a ton of personal information. And why would I be considered a bad person if I wasn't doing that? You see? So it really did like, and I hope anyone who's feeling this with Twin Flames Universe, 
I really, or any cult group, I really hope that you recognize how empowering it is to take the steps that you are taking. It is hard to get out of these groups. It is hard to acknowledge that you've been in a group. It's really damaging to yourself and your sense of self that you feel like you fell for something or were duped into something or too stupid to see the signs. You're not stupid. You're not dumb. You're not too emotional. You're none of those things you tell yourself when you're getting out of a cult. You are just a vulnerable person who wanted to do better. You were just a vulnerable person who wanted to have a better life experience, whether that was becoming better for yourself, whether that was wanting to change your mindset so that you were successful in work, whether it's finding your twin flame. There's nothing wrong with you. Everyone and anyone can get sucked into a cult. It doesn't matter your level of education. It doesn't matter your street smarts. None of it matters. And I'm going to be honest and frank with you. If you're someone watching this video and you think, well, I'd never fall for that, you would. You would probably be the first one to fall for it because you are okay being blind to the signs of what it is. But I trust that if you're here, you're at least open-minded to hear people's experiences and stories. And I hope that with me sharing mine, it helps you want to open up and share yours. Um, and I really hope that the audience that is finding this channel, we're all open-minded, kind, loving people that want to support each other because recognizing you're in a cult and getting out is a really, really difficult and daunting ordeal and practice, and it can take years to heal. I still don't do like full breathwork rounds because I part of me feels like it's bad or evil or something. And I used to really love the practice. And there were things in the cult that benefited me. I don't think if I had had that experience, I would have really learned to stick up for myself because the people I had to stick up to the most were the people leading that group. So it really did help me in the long term. And so if you're leaving a cult or escaping from a group, you're becoming so strong. You are becoming the absolute best version of yourself. And it's okay if certain things within the group still resonate with you. Because without some of those teachings, you might not be where you are today where you actually were able to say like, no, I trust myself. I trust my instincts. This group is bad. This group is dangerous. And I'm getting out. That is incredible. And I applaud you for doing so. Well, I've been talking for way too long like I knew I would. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gave you some insight as to the purpose of this channel and why I do what I do. Um, and I hope it inspires you to either get out of your group or um, be kinder to people within the group and be kind to yourself. Be kind to yourself. You're always doing your best and that's the best you can do. So with that, I hope you have an amazing rest of your Thanksgiving of 2023. Have a great rest of your week. And please share down below your story. If you want to email me your story, you can do so at erinfinley at gmail.com. You'll see it down below in the description. Uh, or you can leave and share your story here in the comments. That's fine too. And um, thank you all so much for being so open-minded and kind and I will see you in my next video. We have some really cool, hopefully, interviews and collabs coming up, and I would love to share your stories. Um, I'd love to have a series on my channel where I just share true cult survivor stories anonymously. So if you send me an email and you say you want to be anonymous and you don't want me to mention the group that you're in because you're scared or you're in a group and you don't really know how to navigate finding your way out, please let me know. Email me. Um, thank you if you already have. Thank you if you've shared screenshots of stuff from the group because I did get kicked out of the Twin Flames open forum. So if you have any crazy things that you are seeing in there, please feel free to send those up my way. I would love to analyze them. And just please take care of yourself. Your mind is the most important thing to nurture. So please take care of yourself and create your boundaries. Ask questions. Always put yourself first. It's okay to be selfish. You should be a little more selfish because I'm sure if you're watching this, you're a giving person who's gotten roped into a cult and you don't deserve the way people are treating you. Anyways, I love you. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate your support once again. Have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your week. Thank you.